Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're located. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on the subject of eStewards version 4.0. We're going to provide an overview of the changes uh, between version 3.1 and version 4.0. My name is Austin Matthews. I'm the EHS Assistant Program Manager with PJR. So again, welcome. I'm gonna go over a brief agenda here. Um, and also really quickly, today's uh, webinar is being recorded. So you'll be able to obtain a recording of the webinar from PJR's website in a day or two. Um, it should link to our YouTube channel with a recording of the webinar. You can also obtain a copy of our slides, uh, today's webinar slides, from PGR's website within the next day or so. So if you have to um, step out before the webinar is over or if you want to utilize the, the training materials later, uh, you'll have access to that. So today's webinar will cover a little bit about PJR. We will talk about the benefits to a certification such as eStewards. We will cover the transition information for the standard. We will cover the key changes at a high level, provide a, a more detailed overview of the standard and some of those changes, how they, um, how they relate to the standard or how the standard is set up. And at the end of the presentation, we'll provide an overview of the certification process for anyone who will be pursuing certification for the first time rather than transitioning from 3.1 to 4.0. And we'll close with questions. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your questions into the chat field, but I will be saving those for the end. This is um, a pretty lengthy webinar, so I'm going to go through it as quickly as possible. Um, not necessarily reading all of the content. Again, the slides will be available uh, to review on the website if there was anything that you wanted to send, spend some more time on. My contact information will be on the last slide as well in case you have any questions outside of today's webinar. So PJR is one of the leading registrars in the world. We have certified companies uh, around the world to a variety of standards. This is not an all-inclusive list, but certainly gives you an idea of our global presence as a certification body or as a registrar. And PJR is accredited to grant certification, like I said, to a variety of standards. eStewards is, of course, one of those standards, and we will pursue accreditation to version 4.0 now that that has been released. We are already accredited to version 3.1, and have been conducting audits and providing accredited certificates to that standard already. Benefits and drivers for certification to e-stewards include a commitment to preventing irresponsible or illegal handling of hazardous or e-waste, data security and protection, social responsibility and environmental protection or conservation. It represents, the standard represents a reduction of environmental, occupational health and safety risks, as well as data security risks and social accountability risks. So those are some of the things that the standard represents. And by maintaining and advertising your certification to the standard, you can also advertise uh, these controls or these uh, intentions. Certification to eStewards also has uh, benefits related to business management, uh, including improving public image. Like I said, by being able to advertise this particular certification, you're advertising the items that we already covered. Um, it could provide uh, improvements to public image, could also provide a competitive advantage over competitors who don't have e-stewards or a similar certification to advertise. You can also advertise the responsible management of electronics and electronic components, which goes a long way in certain industries. And the standard represents a framework for maintaining compliance with both customer and regulatory requirements 
and version 4.0 includes uh, the Basel Convention and the Ban Amendment. Version 4.0 specifically uh, was published pretty recently, February of this year. You can find a copy of the standard as well as a copy of the eStewards guidance document on the eStewards website. I've included a link here. Um, you can also just Google it. The slides probably won't have the active link in them. I'm not sure. Um, I do want to note that version 4.0 is free, unlike version 3.1 and its predecessors. It requires no end user agreement, and this is because the 14001, the ISO 14001 uh, proprietary language has been removed. So that's uh, one of the key changes we'll talk about when we get to that section. But you can download those two uh, documents for free from the eStewards website. It's not required for this webinar, but I do certainly encourage you to download a copy of those and start becoming familiar with um, the contents of those documents. So in terms of transition, eStewards has released a transition plan and PJR has released their own based on uh, the eStewards transition plan. eStewards has set a transition deadline of August 24th, 2021. On that date, any remaining version 3.1 certificates will be withdrawn and invalidated. The original transition plan indicated that all audits beginning after August 24th of this year, 2020, needed to be conducted to version 4.0. So if your audit is scheduled to take place in July next month, you're good to go with 3.1 and early in August, same thing. If your audit was scheduled to take place, say, September, then you would be expected to go to version 4. The results of audits to version 4.0 won't negatively impact your status to 3.1. If you have findings uh, related to those key changes between the two versions um, and you need to make any changes uh, that may take longer than your certificate um, is good for if you're doing a recertification audit, for example, you're still certified to 3.1 in the interim. So keep that in mind as well, up through that August 24th, 2021 deadline. I do want to note that eStewards just recently announced an extension for this particular deadline uh, in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. They have extended um, that requirement to start auditing to version 4 to January 1st of next year. This is really recent information, and I can't say whether PJR uh, at this time will change its recommendations of when our clients will should be ready to transition, but I will keep both the transition plan website and the contents of these webinars, which I'm hosting on a monthly basis um, in preparation for this upcoming transition I'll keep that information up to date. So you can keep an eye out for that. You can discuss it with your scheduler if you have an audit in this window of time that could be impacted. And like I said, I'll share more information as I have it. Um, I already referred to eStewards um, transition plan and PGRs can be found on our website. Again, I will revise that if PGR changes its position in relation to the extension recently uh, communicated, but in the meantime, PGR had recommended a deadline of June 1st of next year by which all trans transition audits should occur. This relates to the August uh, 24th, 2021 deadline to transition or your 3.1 certificate becomes obsolete. So by making sure your audit takes place by June, that gives us enough time to close out the audit package and issue the certificate um, this is the way we can guarantee you don't have a lapse in certification. It's not enough to have your audit take place before the expiration date or that deadline. The package has to be closed. If you have findings that result from your audit, they need to go through the corrective action process, be accepted by the auditor. We have an internal package review process that all the audits would go through. Um, and then the once approved, the audit package would go to the certificate department who would issue a draft certificate that needs to be approved by the client before a final version can be issued. All of that needs to take place before that deadline. So keep this in mind when you're scheduling your audit for next year.
Transition audits can occur during either a surveillance or a recertification audit uh, based on where you are in your cycle and your preference. Uh, we do reserve the right to add audit time to a surveillance audit to cover transition requirements as necessary. Our plan is to be ready to conduct audits to version 4.0 uh, by the original timeline. And again, I'll keep the content of this uh, webinar updated. I have a visual representation of the transition timeline expectations as well. I'll also keep this updated. Standard was published. Our auditors have already been trained. Beginning August 25th of 2020, as originally planned, we'll begin conducting, we won't conduct any more audits to version 3.1. This may be extended. I'll keep this updated. June 1st of next year is the deadline that PJR has set internally, our recommendation. This is the date by which your audit needs to take place for us to have that guarantee of no lapse in certification. If your audit takes place any closer to the deadline, we can't necessarily guarantee uh, you won't have a lapse. The deadline to transition is still August 24th of next year. And we'll talk about this later, but there's also another deadline associated with the standard July 1st of 2022. All East stewards will need the NAID AAA data security certification uh, by this date. So we'll talk more about that when we get to that section. Okay, at a high level, some of the key changes of the standard. Uh, overall, the standard is much shorter because they've removed that ISO 14001 verbiage, as I mentioned earlier. And I already mentioned that it's available for free. The standard is supposed to be easier to understand. It's supposed to be less prescriptive overall, um, providing clients with more flexibility in how they meet some of the requirements of the standard, but it does retain rigor in the key areas. The standard, the version 4.0 of the standard, incorporates the new Basel Convention trade rules and recent amendments. Since the ISO 14001 language has been removed, it does require a separate ISO 14001 certification. So in the past, you would be certified to both uh, through this one audit, and there were some discounts in audit time. So I do want to note that Appendix C of eStewards version 4.0 specifies the audit time calculations certification bodies need to utilize. And by separating these two out, you can expect an increase in your audit time overall. I mentioned this briefly already, but another key change is that clients will be required to obtain NAID AAA certification by July 1st of 2022. This will take care of the data security requirements in the standard. Um, after a client obtains this certification, we won't have to audit that section of the standard. We'll talk about that later as well. And during the eStewards training, they did mention that they negotiated lower fees for eStewards certified organizations uh, because NEED has its own set of fees. So that's something to keep in mind. You're certainly welcome to obtain that certification before this deadline, uh, but this would be the deadline to obtain it. Otherwise, your eStewards certification would be either suspended or withdrawn. They also have a guidance document I mentioned earlier, contains some examples, um, how-tos for clients. There is an increased number of definitions in the standard. I do want to note that the um, HEW term in version 4.0 replaces HEE from version 3.1 and its predecessors. And this represents a subset of MOCs. Uh, we'll talk about these shortly. Version 4.1 includes, ex uh, excuse me, version 4.0 includes extended producer requirements. It relaxes inventory requirements for QSCs. Uh, for example, you can put them in lots instead of inventorying each individual unit. We'll talk about these terms uh, shortly. Version 4.0 allows but regulates tolling. 
and has added some uh, noise monitoring elements. In some cases, annual sampling is reduced. They've added more flexibility to the battery testing requirements, removing some of the more outdated information or requirements. On-site downstream audits are de decreased from every two years to every three years. Version 4.0 adds closure plan, financial instrument, and insurance checks. I want to say that's in regards to uh, downstream accountability. There are also appendices on various subjects in version 4.0, uh, standard implementation, rules for organizations, rules for certification bodies, and data security requirements, respectively. So we'll take a look at those as well. OK. So I mentioned um, some term changes or increases in the number of terms and definitions. So all of the ISO 14001 terms have been removed because those can be found in the ISO 14001 standard. Um, there are some revised terms. I've made a list here. We certainly don't have time to go through all of them. I mentioned HEWs already, hazardous electronic waste. And there are a number of new terms. I mentioned a couple of these already, materials of concern and qualified smaller components. A couple of terms have also been removed. I mentioned HEE has been replaced by HEW. Um, they've removed the broker term. So certainly review these slides um, and the standard in more detail on your own time. Some of these terms will reply, apply more to certain organizations than others. It depends on uh, your role within the industry. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. We'll go through the standard in more detail as time allows. Uh, this, like I said, is a lengthy webinar. So I'm going to move pretty quickly and try and touch on as many of the high points as possible so we can get through all of the content um, and have time for questions without going too far over our, our uh, time slot here. So regarding clause 4.1, the only significant change here um, worth mentioning we have some specified inclusions for the documented scope. So take a look at 4.1. If they're providing you a list of what needs to be included, make sure that gets included in the documented scope. 4.1 also requires consideration of the precautionary principle, uh, which is not a new concept. Attempts to reduce negative uh, electronic equipment lifecycle impacts, adherence to the waste management hierarchy where possible, and transparent handling of materials of concern throughout the recycling chain. So these don't necessarily need to be listed in the documented scope, keyword being consideration. Section 5.1 covers leadership and commitment. There's no significant changes here, so I'm going to skip over the sections that don't have uh, much to discuss. There are, again, some specified items to include within the documented policy. I've listed some examples here, but you're going to want to go to these sections of the standard and compare them to what you have documented to perform a gap analysis or understand what revisions are needed on your end. An example would be including protection from harassment and discrimination, but certainly there are others. 5.3 covers roles, responsibilities, and authority. This requires establishment of teams for implementing and improving the SMS, which is a new term I should have touched on very briefly. Stewardship management system. We see this term throughout the presentation and the standard. In some other standards, you might see EHSMS or something similar. The stewardship management system will refer to everything that the e-stewards standard stands for. So you have the EHS elements, but you also have the data security and the uh, social accountability or stewardship uh, pieces. So SMS represents the stewardship management system. <clears throat> so we're going to be looking for teams to this end, including a safety team. 
to include representation from all levels of the organization. Regarding action to address risks and opportunities, you need to plan and document tasks for addressing and monitoring risks and opportunities. Again, remember that you're also going to need ISO 14001 certification in conjunction with this. So some of these are shortened because the verbiage can be found in the other standard instead. No changes to the frequency or scope of risk assessments. It, this section does specify items to be included in the risk assessment. This now includes PHPTs utilized for electronic equipment processing and other hazardous substances present. The qualifications for who is performing the risk assessment is not specified within the standard. Uh, PHPTs is uh, potentially hazardous processing techniques. The stewardship aspect clause 6.1.2 again specifies specific items to be considered. So they don't necessarily need to be listed out or all included. But you need to make sure they're considered within the process. Life cycle perspective, that's it, in alignment with ISO 14001 as well. The precautionary principle is not new. The waste management hierarchy, significant changes, etc. The standard does require documented information as evidence of the criteria and the results, as well as communication as relevant. So keep that in mind as well. No significant changes to the compliance obligations requirements, although again it's shorter due to the ISO 14001 verbiage being removed. International waste trade agreements and national laws, MOCs are to be treated as hazardous waste in version 4.0, materials of concern. E-stewards organizations must adhere to the Basel Convention's Article 4A, that's the Basel, the Basel Ban Amendment, even if their country has not ratified it like the US. I mentioned extended producer responsibility programs are included or extended producer requirements. This is a new section. This is 6.1.3.2. Take a look at the definition of the extended producer term if you're unsure whether that applies to you or how it relates to you, if at all. Documented information is required for organizations participating in the extended producer responsibility programs to be made available upon request. I'm not going to spend any more time on that as it might not apply to everyone. 6.1.4 is um, a new section within the standard, the body of the standard. It covers performance verifications. This isn't a new requirement, but it's now within the standard document. It requires a documented plan for unannounced performance verification program inspections performed by e-stewards with specified items to be included. Again, this is not a new requirement, um, so this should not be news. 6.1.4.1 covers the reporting to the e-stewards database. Um, the need to report all electronic equipment under the organization's control or passing through the organization's control to the e-stewards website in English. This is further detailed in Appendix A, specifically 6.1.4.1. This requires an initial report prior to certification and then an annual report by January 31st of each year, focusing on the previous year. That initial report should be uh, between passing the stage one. I apologize, there's a typo here. I'll fix that. Okay, the stewardship objectives and planning, no changes, shorter with the verbiage for 14,001 removed. Planning for changes 6.3, this is a new section. It relates to uh, the proactive planning of changes or management of change, if you're familiar with that concept. 
So wherever a significant change is concerned, and this is uh, capitalized as it's a term, an actual defined term, any significant changes to the SMS require this planning for change process, including uh, considering any training requirements, communication, monitoring, documentation, et cetera. Again, this is the idea of proactively planning changes before they take place to assess how they could impact the SMS and to be able to implement appropriate controls um, alongside the change or before the change to avoid any negative impacts uh, associated with implementing that change. 6.4 focuses on contingency planning. It specifies items to be included and documented um, in the contingency planning evidence, such as names and contact information for the third party holding the organization's financial instrument, just as one example. So again, here you'll want to look at this section of the standard, compare it to what you already have to understand uh, what this transition will take. There are no significant changes to the actual uh, site closure plan. Regarding the financial surety, in 6.4.2, they've removed the option for a corporate parent to hold the financial instrument. On the other hand, it does provide an exemption from the requirement to have a financial instrument if the e-stewards organization's closure costs are less than 5,000 US dollars. And there will be a requirement to provide evidence of this if the facility meets these requirements. No significant changes to insurance requirements, although it does remove the qualifications for the insurance uh, professional. No changes regarding resources or competence worth noting here today. Similarly, no significant changes to awareness or the general communication requirements. So we're gonna skip those sections as well. Internal communication is shorter with the 14,001 verbiage removed, but it does require communication without fear of reprisal. This goes back to uh, one of the items for consideration within the scope, I believe, or to be included within the scope. Maybe that was the policy. I'd have to go back to the slide. But the idea being um, removing the barriers um, such as fear of reprisal or harassment. This would include objectives, operational controls, any relevant changes, as well as the results of inter industrial hygiene monitoring. External communication, on the other hand, requires controls as relevant, emergency response protocols, security requirements for contractors or visitors. So all of this needs to be considered um, and part of the communication process. It also specifies information to be communicated to both upstream customers and the e-stewards program administrator. Some examples include management, a movement of MOCs through the recycling chain and contact information for the sites, records of shipment for all transfers to an IDP, three months worth of sampling of shipment records, equipment and components for reuse, consent from competent authorities where this is applicable, Again, not an all-inclusive list, but gives you an idea of some of the information that needs to be externally communicated. Seven point five covers documented information. For anyone who is already familiar with ISO fourteen thousand one two thousand fifteen, this is not earth-shattering. Um, Three point one already incorporated those twenty fifteen revisions. With the ISO 14001 verbiage removed, these sections are shorter. 7.5.1 covers the general information. It allows organizations to combine or separate documentation requirements as they feel works best for them. As long as they're meeting the overall documented information requirements, they have more flexibility. There are three exceptions to this rule that are worth noting. And the idea here is that eStewards really wants these three documents, 
separated into their own three documents, so not combining these three, but having these three separated out from the rest at, at a minimum, to make sure that they are always easily accessible and easy to recognize um, due to their importance within the standard. These include the closure plan, the, the emergency preparedness and response plan, and the downstream disposition chart. The requirements for creating and updating documented information haven't really changed. Uh, you do need to document changes and revision status. Nothing too earth shattering there. In terms of controlling documented information, it specifies that standard required records need to be maintained for at least five years unless a longer retention period is specified. So this should be the minimum uh, threshold for the organization. Eight point one covers operational planning and control, much shorter again. And the hierarchy of controls is to be utilized where applicable. If anyone is familiar with ISO 45001 or OSS 18001, this is the same hierarchy of controls, no changes. There are no changes to the intent of the emergency preparedness and response requirements. It does require annual drills for relevant emergencies. That would be the only change worth noting. In terms of industrial hygiene, the program is to address hazards of an airborne nature, ergonomic nature, uh, focusing on noise, as well as physical hazards. It also is to uh, include prevention of hazard migration. Depending on your scope and your processes, this may or may not be something you need to worry about too much, but um, Certainly, we've seen a number of clients dealing with this. The idea being keeping the hazards from migrating to common areas, such as the late, the lunchroom, the bathroom, or going home with the employees to be um, to have that exposure shared with family members. Okay, eight point three point one covers potentially hazardous processing technologies. EHPTs, I mentioned that acronym earlier. This portion of the standard specifies additional items to be included in the industrial hygiene program if the organization is using at least one PHPT. So obviously the standard defines what uh, falls into this category. So take a look at that definition or that table. And if this applies to you, this section would be very relevant. So I've included a couple examples. I'm not going to read them all. Um, a couple examples just quickly would be some testing and monitoring protocols with industrial hygiene testing overseen by a certified industrial hygienist or equivalent. This is a defined term within the standard and ensuring that a uh, appropriate, appropriately accredited lab is utilized. There's noise monitoring for balers, shredders, etc. There's an appendix uh, table for monitoring of hazards. It requires in initial industrial hygiene testing in specific areas or for specific processes prior to the stage one. And then again, just a little over a year later. Depending on the results, if mitigation is required, it also requires retesting within three months and some other, um, in other instances as well. So again, this is a pretty lengthy list. If this applies to you, take a very close look at this section, and you can always reach out to me if you've got some specific questions. Not everyone's doing PHPTs, so I wanna move on. 8.4 covers responsible management of electronic equipment. It specifies topics or information to be planned uh, to be determined by the organization. And again, there's that requirement to have enough documented information to provide evidence both of that determination and the implementation of the plan. 8.4.2 covers requirements for operational controls for the processing of electronic equipment, including MOCs. There's a table in this section, table two, 
that covers items restricted from mechanical processing. There's no changes here uh, related to its content unless the organization is using a closed system for processing. Overall, it's less prescriptive and the intent is the same. 8.4.3 covers uh, requirements for packaging, storage, and transportation controls for electronic equipment under the organization's control. This includes uh, a couple of items. I'll mention a few. Not storing MOCs for more than one year, except in certain uh, extenuating circumstances, in which case evidence is required again. Uh, requiring adequate vehicle or driver safety records for transporters and carriers as part of uh, criteria for those uh, workers or contractors, depending on how that works in your specific organization. It introduces stacking limits to no more than two Gaylords or super sacks. Again, there's more found within the standard. I just wanted to highlight a couple examples. Tolling operations, this section 8.4.4 is new. Again, it regulates the tolling process. It requires uh, communication criteria, contract stipulations, annulment of tolling contracts if uh, the agreements are violated or the requirements of these stewards are violated, things like that. And again, we're looking for documented information as evidence of the identification of the process and the implementation of the process, if this applies to your organization. Prison operations are still not permitted unless the organization has obtained written approval from the eStewards program administrator and meets specified criteria within the standard. There are no changes to the intent of the reuse and refurbishment requirements, 8.5. It does prohibit the sale or transfer or donation of non-sanitized electronic equipment unless it's to a NAID AAA certified IDP. The only exclusion to this would be tolling operations where, or instances where the electronic equipment still not sanitized is being sent back to its original owner. Refurbishment and or repair activities can only be outsourced to IDPs. The exception to this would be ink or toner remanufacturing, which can be outsourced one tier further. So you can only go one tier down for your refurbishment and or your repair activities, except for ink and toner where you can go two tiers. Direct reuse must be found to be fully functional, and this is a defined term as well, except for shipments to the IDP for refurbishment and repair that we just talked about um, in the bullet above. So take a look at the fully functional definition. Those criteria, again, compare it to your current process. We don't see significant changes to the intent of the uh, testing requirements either. So overall, the intent is the same. It specifies testing requirements. There are some changes in this section. I mentioned, for example, the battery testing criteria earlier. So again, you'll want to look at the section in more detail if it applies heavily to your organization compared to what you're currently doing. Get a sense of what this transition will look like for you. Again, there are no significant changes to the intent. So it's possible that you might not have much to change here. Table three in this section constitutes exceptions to full functionality testing. Uh, this includes donations or sales of unusual, un, unusual excuse me, used equipment capped at 1% of the total units sold and donated annually. It also includes untested units sold or donated to workers this, this allowance or this line item has been removed from version four. So this is no longer allowed in case that was unclear. 8.5.2, uh, recording, identifying information for each item. This specifies specific criteria to be included. 
but it does, as I mentioned earlier, simplify the inventory requirements for the QSCs. For example, I mentioned this allows the organization to put them in lots instead of labeling or identifying each individual item, which is really not uh, cost effective or practical. Eight point five point two point one covers shipping documentation requirements. It specifies the minimum amount of information to be recorded for all sales and transfers. It also needs to be made accessible without the need for unpacking. So keep that in mind if your process doesn't already take that into consideration. Appendix A includes a declaration sheet. So the declaration sheet or an equivalent would need to be used for all applicable transboundary shipments. You don't necessarily have to use that form, but it has to be equivalent. It has to contain the same information or fields. This section also requires accessibility and availability of identifying information for all shipments besides QSCs, such as itemized packing lists, um, an internet link kept active, etc. So just a couple examples there. 8.5.3 covers verification of direct reuse markets. This is shorter, less prescriptive. Um, I'm noting here that if evidence that shipments were tested for fully functionality, for full functionality, and were sold for three times the scrap rate or more, if you can maintain that evidence, then the buyer information is not required. So that's something to, to note if maintaining the buyer information is cumbersome. These are the criteria you would need to meet in order to avoid that requirement. 8.6.1 specifies management criteria for materials of concern. And again, we're referencing Appendix A for more detail. It requires written proof or justification meeting the specified criteria be provided to the certification body, such as PJR, and the eStewards program administrator before using a conditionally allowable option. So this is something that you need to do beforehand, not after the fact. This isn't one of those ask for forgiveness kind of situations. 8.6.2 covers alternative uses and processes. It specifies uh, things to include in your approval request and other documentation requirements. So if you're looking to utilize that alternative process or an alternative process, it specifies what that looks like. It requires written approval as well from the eStewards program administrator before utilizing that alternative process. So again, you're asking for permission, not uh, forgiveness. So this, this requires not only submitting the documentation in advance, but also obtaining approval from eStewards. It'll also include uh, downstream due diligence as appropriate. 8.7 <clears throat> covers control of transboundary movement. Whole electronic equipment is to be treated as HEWs, hazardous electronic waste, unless the shipment provides documented evidence proving otherwise. Written notification and competent authority consent is required prior to material of concern transboundary movements when countries involved are not Basel Convention parties or covered by relevant multilateral trade agreements. So this is a mouthful, summed up into two uh, bullet points, but again, these slides are available for reference. You should get a hold of a copy of the standard and start familiarizing yourself with this information. So unless clearly proven otherwise with documented evidence, all HEE is to be treated as HEWs, and you need written notification and competent authority consent prior to transboundary movements of MOCs, whenever the countries involved are not Basel party members or covered by some other multilateral agreement. This is gonna require some legwork on your part to identify 
when and if this situation arises to make sure that the controls are in place. 8.7.1 requires or covers exemptions from transboundary movement controls. It specifies exemptions to 8.7 that we just discussed, um, new parts, which are not really part of eStewards anyway, devices purchased under warranty, CRT cullet or glass that is clean and approved as feedstock. So there are some exemptions to 8.7 um, and they would be found in 8.7.1. 8.7.2 covers labeling and declaration requirements, again referencing Appendix A, for any electronic equipment or components exported to IDPs for refurbishment or repair. Again, that's just going that one tier. So that's when it's going for repair or refurbishment. 8.7.3 covers when the electronic equipment is going for direct reuse. So in those cases, electronic equipment would be exported for direct reuse. Being exported for direct reuse needs to be fully functional, which is a defined term, and not be recycled or finally disposed. So it has to have an established resale market and some other items specified in 8.7.3. There would also be labeling and declaration requirements associated with these shipments found um, right next to the section. So the following subsection in Appendix A. So that's repair and refurbishment versus direct reuse destinations. 8.8 .8 covers downstream accountability. This adds the requirement to reevaluate a downstream processor whenever significant changes take place in a timely manner. So this is new verbiage. This section also still applies even if electronic equipment is direct is shipped from the customer to the IDP. So if the organization isn't receiving the material first, but it's directing shipments from the customer to the IDP, this downstream accountability still applies. There are no significant changes to the downstream disposition chart requirements. The organization cannot utilize any downstream processor within their recycling chain that has lost an e-steward certificate in response to a critical nonconformity until the certificate is reinstated. So that was the only point I found worth noting in 8.8.1. And again, you're going to have to have a mechanism for identifying this or a requirement to communicate it or verifying it on your end to establish when when and if a downstream processor in the recycling chain cannot be used. 8.8.2 covers downstream due diligence. It requires attainment of support documentation and approval of downstream providers and intermediaries within the entire recycling chain according to the requirements of 8.8.2.1 through 8.8.2.6. So there's several sub requirements here. We'll look at them briefly. 8.8.2.1 um, specifies initial, meaning prior to shipment, and subsequently annual evaluation criteria with additional verifications for downstream processors that are not certified to eStewards. So if you're using an eStewards downstream processor, that saves uh, some of the downstream uh, due diligence legwork. Regarding desk audits, uh, it again speci specifies initial prior to first shipment and subsequently annual evaluation criteria for downstream processors to have this desktop audit piece taken care of, the only exception being final disposal facilities. 8.8.2.3 covers on-site audits for IDPs. This is not required if the IDP is e-steward. So again, if you're using someone who's e-stewards, it's a little bit easier. So you don't have to do the on-site audits for IDPs that are e-stewards. You also don't have to do on-site audits for a final disposal facility or an end processor if the end processor is licensed, permitted, and located in an OECD country. The on-site audits are required initially prior to first shipment and again every three years. This is relaxed from the two-year requirement in version 3.1 you also may need to go back on site for significant changes in these 
instances. This now includes, as I mentioned earlier, a review of closure plans and financial surety for the IDP and their recycling chain. So in terms of downstream accountability or due diligence, the closure plan and the financial surety weren't necessarily listed in this way or included in those criteria to the extent that they are now. 8.8.2.4 covers agreements and control systems. Version 4.0 requires a written contract or agreement or some type of equivalent control containing specified information for all HEWs and PCM IDPs if they're not a steward certified, if they're not a final disposal facility, and if they're not an end processor in an OECD country. So above and beyond the requirements we talked about, we talked about in 8.8.2.1 through 8.8.2.3. You also need this written uh, contract or equivalent Again, unless they're a stewards certified, a final disposal facility, or an end processor. This section also requires the DP, the downstream processor, but beyond an IDP, to implement and meet uh, these requirements throughout the recycling chain. So this kind of flows that down. No significant changes regarding HEW transportation company requirements. And 8.8.6, 8.8.2.6, excuse me, covers records of transfer. It specifies retention of shipping records, as well as annual sampling of shipments between each IDP and the next non e stewards downstream processors. Data security is covered in 8.9. Specifically, it references Appendix D. As I mentioned, once organizations become certified to need AAA cert, uh, certification, once they obtain that certification, we don't need to audit to Appendix D anymore. The NAID certification will satisfy the data security requirements for the East Stewards organization. So you can certainly obtain that sooner rather than later, but the deadline will be July 1st of 2022. No changes or no significant changes to performance evaluation regarding monitoring and measurement. Shorter, less prescriptive with the ISO 14001 verbiage removed. Same thing for evaluations of compliance, although it does require at least annual compliance evaluations. No changes to facility inspections. Electronic equipment flow monitoring is shorter and less prescriptive. It is worth noting, though, that it does require corrective action if the material balance accounting has a final discrepancy higher than 5%. So this is new. Not only do you need to track this discrepancy, you also need to take corrective action if it's above this threshold. Internal audits are unchanged. Management review is mostly unchanged. There are some specified inputs here. Um, to the management review process that might be outside of the ISO 14001 verbiage. Um, so take a look at that section. And no significant changes to uh, Clause 10 covering improvement. Take a quick look at the appendices as well before we get to um, the certification process overview and the questions. Again, I'm sorry if I'm moving too quickly. I just want to get um, all the information covered today. Appendix A includes additional details and criteria for implementing the standard, and you saw several times throughout my slides referencing Appendix A as well. Um, annual e-stewards database reporting, PHPT hazard testing requirements table, uh, the shipment declarations, etc. There's a whole bunch of information in Appendix A for the organizations to utilize. Appendix B covers administrative criteria for e-stewards organization. This covers things like um, who's eligible for certification, the scope of the certification, um, how it relates to ancillary sites, parent companies, subsidiaries, etc., cetera, um, applications and contracts, appropriate logo usage, um, the critical nonconformities process, the uh, performance verification inspection process, things like that. It requires a new license agreement if the organization is purchased by another company, 
or if there's a similar change in ownership. So that is something worth noting. Appendix B also requires the certified organization notify their certification body, such as PJR, and the East Stewart's program administrator of significant changes affecting conformity to the standard within 15 business days, unless the certification body has a requirement to communicate them even sooner. So take a look at that significant changes definition, make sure you're familiar with what that term represents and then have controls in place to trigger those communications. Appendix C covers administrative criteria for certification bodies, such as PJR and accreditation bodies, um, such as ANAB. It also specifies audit time calculations, which we are uh, required to adhere to. So as I mentioned earlier, audit time will be calculated differently now that ISO 14001 has been separated out and this will increase audit time overall for clients. This is not something that PJR creates, and you should see the same across other registrars or certification bodies since this is specified by eStewards. Appendix D covers the data security criteria, as I mentioned, when for organizations not yet certified to need AAA. Covers things like regulatory requirements, communication of risks, security processes, uh, sanita sanitization methods, as well as effectiveness verifications, and controls related to security breaches or similar incidents. Okay, so really briefly for anyone pursuing certification for the first time, the recommended steps are to give you an idea of what to expect. You'll want to obtain a copy of the standard, Establish documentation associated with the eStewards requirements for your SMS. Conduct any training required by your SMS. Implement the requirements um, within that documentation and within the standard, including conducting an internal audit, a compliance evaluation, and your management review, which should take place after your internal audit so the results of those audits can be included in the review. You'll need a, con you'll need a uh, contract with a certification body such as PJR to conduct your audits. And that initial registration process is compri comprised of two audits, a stage one audit and a stage two audit. I'll talk about those in more detail on the next slide, but any nonconformities, if any, that result from the stage two audit will need to be addressed before a certificate can be issued. So the stage one process is an on-site, uh, usually on-site, a documentation review, essentially, of the whole system. Um, we are assessing your readiness to move on to stage two, evaluating whether the documentation framework or the framework that you have uh, created, whether or not it meets the requirements of the standard at, as it is intended or as, as a framework. The stage two audit focuses on the implementation of that framework, the implementation of the requirements of the standard, and whether or not the requirements of the standard are being effectively met. So this will be an on-site audit of the entire management system, all of the processes, all of the shifts to get a, a really clear picture of how effectively everything has been implemented. Again, you could result, um, you could have your stage two audit result in nonconformities which would need to go through the corrective action process before a certificate could be issued. A certificate is good for three years. You'll then go on to a surveillance cycle. So you'll have two years worth of surveillance audits, whether annual or semi-annual, depending on your contract. Those represent partial system audits. They don't have to cover all of the processes like the stage two audit does although there are certain uh, processes that we cover during every audit. That third year of the cycle will be a recertification audit, which for all intensive purposes is, is the same as the stage two. It covers all of the processes, all the shifts, um, and once the package is closed and the audit resolved um, would result in a new certificate and that surveillance cycle starts all over. So just at a really high level, that's what you can expect if you are pursuing certification for the first time.
If you have any questions and you haven't already typed them in, please go ahead and do that now. I'm going to switch ahead to the contact information slide. For anyone who has more technical questions or something that would be better to discuss offline, I can be reached via email. Again, my name is Austin Matthews, EHS Assistant Program Manager with PJR, or you can call the main uh, PJR number and reach me that way as well. Stacey DeSantis is our EHS Program Manager. She would be available to answer questions as well. And if you are a new client, client looking for a quote, I've also included the contact information for our sales department. Um, they can help you with that. So I'm going to leave my contact information up um, in case anyone would be more comfortable talking offline. And I'm going to just check and see if we have any questions here. Okay, it does not look like we have any questions. I'll hang out for one more minute in case anyone is still typing. Okay, doesn't look like we have any questions. So again, the recording and the slides will be available on PGR's website. Feel free to reach out with any questions should you come up with them later. Um, good luck with your transition when you guys are ready to transition. Keep an eye out for future revisions of the webinar, any changes to the transition plan, as I mentioned, um, and I am available by phone and email if you have any questions. Thanks for joining me today, and good luck with your transition. Mm -hmm.